Zzzz, what was that on your arm? A bee. Great. Not exactly a pleasant feeling. Painful, itchy, annoying, scary. We've all been there before. So, that happens because the bee jabs its barbed stinger into your skin and releases some venom. The venom contains proteins that cause pain and can affect your immune system and skin cells. But that's nothing compared to what the bee has to go through. Poor little thing. You'll be fine after a few hours, but the bee? Not so much. Honeybees don't usually sting people unless they feel threatened or if you accidentally step on them. The problem is that after stinging you, the bee can't pull its barbed stinger out of your skin. The only way to get free is to leave the stinger behind. The stinger though, not just a sweet defense mechanism, it also contains part of the bee's digestive tract, nerves, and muscles that are, unfortunately, essential for the bee to function normally. So, yep, after losing all that, this tiny creature doesn't survive. Yikes, poor little bee. Apart from that, they're such cool animals. They have five eyes, two pairs of wings, and six legs. Bees have excellent survival instincts, and they've been around for a really long time. 130 million years and counting. Who knows what ancient species they've stung? Most bees in the hive are called worker bees, and the big cheese is called the queen. She lays around 2,000 eggs per day. Sound like a lot? Well, the average hive contains 50,000 bees, and they disappear after just one sting. I guess going through a painful and itchy experience doesn't actually sound that bad when you only have one bee on your arm. Imagine if you had the whole hive. It may seem like bees just aimlessly fly around or use their vision to decide where they go. But these cool insects are pretty organized and rely on a super complex transport system. Imagine planning a cross-country road trip, only this time there are no roads. I can't even make it to the gym without my GPS, or if I stop at a burger joint on the way there. But not bees, they're way cooler than us. They use bee lines. Well, I call them that. They're basically a series of insect pathways bees tend to follow through human towns or the countryside. These pathways link every existing wildlife area together. It's like a bee railway system. My favorite bee is the buff-tailed bumblebee. It has an oval-shaped body covered in dense hair and a brain the size of a poppy seed. Considering how small it is, that's really impressive. How smart are they? Scientists made an experiment where they trained a bunch of them to play bee soccer. They even learned how to score a goal in return for a sweet sugary treat. Unbelievable! These same bees have another amazing ability. They use their smelly footprints to distinguish between the scents of strangers, their own bee relatives. They can even recognize their own scent. Bumblebees, we know your dirty little secret. You have smelly feet. And then, there's the queen bee. She's unique in her colony, and her main task? Laying eggs. People often assume the queen is there to tell the other bees exactly what to do. Yeah, not really. She does have a certain influence. But even without her, the hive actually functions pretty well. Each bee has a job and knows its daily functions and tasks because of its instincts and the chemical signals it senses and uses. So, I guess no one needs to tell them how to behave. Those chemical signals are their way of communicating. Oh, and they know how to shake it. They wiggle their bodies at specific angles for a certain amount of time. That's how they send messages to each other. If something happens to the queen bee and she doesn't survive, worker bees create a new one. Yep, they don't find one, but sort of raise a new one. They choose a young larva and feed the future, Her Majesty, a special food called royal jelly. That lucky larva can now grow into the new queen. Bees are fast. They can beat their wings almost 200 times a second. Those eight push-ups I can do in a minute, not sounding so impressive. Each bee produces around one teaspoon of honey in its lifetime. To produce one pound of honey, bees have to fly the equivalent of one whole time around the globe. These hardworking animals make around 100 million trips to about 200 million flowers to collect enough nectar for that pound of honey. Honeybees sleep five to eight hours a day, and just like us, they rest at night. Their brains are pretty active when they're resting. Some scientists think they may be dreaming, also just like us. When winter rolls around, a lot of insects replace their body water with a special chemical called glycerol. It's a type of natural antifreeze that helps them stay alive in low temperatures. Bees, though, they just huddle together in the hive to stay toasty warm. All right, enough about bees. Let's whip round the animal kingdom looking for crazy facts. Bats could eat a thousand insects an hour if they were insanely hungry. They're the only mammal that can fly, and their bones are so thin, most of them can't even walk. Insects, for the most part, don't have ears on their heads. Instead, they have them all over their bodies. Snails can sleep for three years without waking up. Slugs have four noses, so they better avoid those stinky feet bumblebees. Butterflies are quite simple and practical animals that taste with their feet and only feed on liquids. 
They're cold-blooded, so if it gets below 55 degrees, they can't fly, look for food, or escape a sticky situation. Their main defense tactic is camouflage. Works pretty well until it gets cold. The opposite strategy is having vibrant, colorful patterns that let everyone know where you are. Colorful insects are often toxic, so birds and bigger insects tend to leave them alone. Wasps recognize their relatives by identifying unique facial patterns. Ants don't have lungs. Instead, they breathe through small holes all over their bodies. Also, they almost never sleep, but they do love to nap. Ants are incredibly strong and can carry more than 50 times their own weight. If you were that strong, you'd be able to carry an adult elephant. You know, like if it's stepping on your toe and you want to get it off you. For every human, there are more than a million ants and over 200 million insects. Luckily, they're smaller than us. If they weren't, we'd be the ants. A wildlife administrator at an airport can escort a deer off the airfield. They can keep a family of ducks away from the airport's wet pond. They can even shoo off wayward raccoons hiding in terminal buildings. What they can't do is deal with honeybees. In August 2012, hundreds of thousands of honeybees swarmed the body of a Delta plane heading to New York City. It happened when the crew was preparing to fuel the aircraft and load the luggage. It was time for master beekeeper Stephen Rapaski to come into play. At that time, it was already the fourth swarm the airport had to deal with in the past few months. And when in May 2012, more than 15,000 bees covered a light on taxiway C, it caused a serious flight delay. That's when the airport's wildlife administrator started to Google nearby beekeepers. Luckily, he came across Mr. Rapaski, who was later employed as a contractor. Inside chimneys, on tree limbs, garages, support beams, and attics, you can find their nests everywhere around the house. They're not only going to ruin your picnic and mess with your food, or try to sting you if you make them angry, but they'll look for sheltered areas in your backyard to build a nest, most commonly in the ceiling of the covered outdoor porch. The important thing is to find a place that can support the weight of their home and the entire community. This is what paper wasps like to do, a group among 30,000 different wasp species. You can recognize them by the way they build their nests. The queen wasp starts building the first structure on her own. The males add on to it later. When you see a larger group of wasps flying in a similar direction, follow them. They leave their nest a couple of times a day to gather food, but they always go back to take care of their young and their queen. Also, they're buzzing pretty loudly while building a nest, so... Oh, there it is! Let's take a closer look at their nest and check what's inside. They're mostly umbrella-shaped, made of grey, papery material. Wasps build it out of pulp or saliva. Their nests can get pretty big. The biggest wasp nest found was 18 feet across and 12 feet long. Paper wasps build smaller nests, while hornets, another wasp species, create bigger ones shaped like a football. The outer part is the hardest. Cells there are wider and denser. The root is the foundation the whole nest is built off of. Inside, you can see cells. It's where the larvae are. Wasps are similar to butterflies. They're part of a special group of insects that go through a metamorphosis, a process where an animal's body changes when becoming an adult. These cells are actually cribs for younger wasps that are about to grow up. As wasps build nests, they leave these cells open. The queens are in charge. They lay the eggs in these cells and seal them off. Cells look like hollow cylinders. They form some sort of hexagon, which holds the other cells. Inside the nest, everything's compact so that many of these cells can fit in a very tight space and still have an incredibly strong structure. Cells are the crib and the cocoon at the same time. Their size is big enough to fit the larvae, together with its roommates. Grown-up wasps often leave some food with the egg, so the young, after it hatches, has the meal served. You can see the drones, which are male wasps, circle around from cell to cell. They want to make sure everything's okay and each larva has enough food. Nests need to be at a stable temperature with high humidity because of larvae. That's why wasps are working hard to insulate the nest. Such nests mostly have domes built of plant material, saliva, or paper. A wasp is roaming around, looking for the proper material. When it finds wood, it chews it up, mixing it with saliva. This way, the wasp makes the strong glue and lays it in thin layers. But layers need to be dense to make the entire nest stronger and sturdier. Ta-da! The core is done! The queen then wraps the nest in some sort of an envelope. Light, thin sheets made of macerated pulp. It protects the cells inside and limits the entrance, so you can only go inside through one tiny hole. 
This way, they can easily maintain the internal humidity and temperature. If you're looking for honey, the wrong hive. Bees have it, not wasps. They mostly have black and yellow bodies, although wasps come in many different colors like blue, orange, green, red. Wasps and bees are almost the same size. Bees are chunkier and have more hair. Wasps are thinner and smoother. They have a waist and a narrow petiole. They both pollinate flowers, even though wasps do it a little bit less than bees because they don't have so much fine hair on their bodies, so the pollen can't stick to it. Bees farm nectar to produce honey, which is the food of their larvae. Wasps are way more aggressive. They eat meat, which means they bring other insects and bugs for their young, or their remains. Wasps identify each other by scent, but also, just like we do, by unique facial patterns. They are the first case where scientists discovered animals identifying faces the way humans do. Queens recognize other queens, and they're constantly battling to set up a hierarchy in the colony. That means each wasp knows who's in charge of work or food distribution, and who's there to bring the new larvae into this world. Wasps have a rich social life, so they need to memorize lots of faces and also distinguish wasps that live in their nest from those that don't. Wasps are useful for humans because they eat insects, and by that, control the population of bugs that destroy crops. Wasps put so much effort to build their nests, and still, they only last when it's warm outside. They start building it from spring and live there until fall. The worker wasps don't survive cold winters. Only some queens do because they have something similar to antifreeze in their blood. They're in charge of creating a new life for the new nest the next year. When a wasp colony is gone, some other species use their nests, like hoverflies. They look similar to wasps, but they survive winter. Just like wasp queens, hoverflies hibernate in sheltered places with a nice temperature, so abandoned wasp nests seem perfect. Hornets even come to active nests when wasps are still there and feed on debris. They don't even get stung. Only female wasps can sting, and they do it when defending themselves. A wasp queen can live up to a year, and worker wasps up to 22 days. Paper wasp colonies are mostly small. They have 100 to 200 cells and up to 100 adults. Some bigger nests will have 400 cells, but yellow jackets build super nests you really want to stay away from. They have up to 15,000 worker wasps. Don't look up in tree canopies or outside of the house to find their nests. Instead, look within your walls or down so you don't stomp on them because they build underground nests. Even though they're smaller than other wasp species, they're way more aggressive. Yellow jackets have strong instincts when it comes to protecting the nest, so they'll get mad if you violate their peace and try to sting you multiple times. They can do it, unlike bees that can only sting once. Bzzz. The sound you hear when bees aren't around doesn't come from their mouths. You hear it because they're beating their wings while flying really fast. When they're in the air, their wings make vibrations the human ear recognizes as buzzing. It's especially loud when it comes to smaller insects. Bigger bees have slower wing beats, which means the pitch of the buzzing gets lower. Insects buzz to get pollen off the flower as they move their bodies and wings. The pollen then attaches to the bee. It flies towards the next flower and deposits the pollen there. This process is called pollination. You will also hear buzzing when they're defending their hives or themselves, especially if you get too close to a bee in its natural habitat. This buzzing sound is like some kind of a warning to move away or get ready to face the angry bee. Ouch, that was a painful one. But hey, what, ouch, was that another sting? In that case, it's not a honeybee. A honeybee can only sting once. When it does, you can see the small stinger protruding on your skin. Once that's done, the bee can no longer pull the stinger back out. Since the stinger has nerves, muscles, and is part of the bee's digestive tract, the bee doesn't survive. Yellow jackets are a type of wasp that doesn't have such a problem. They will sting you multiple times, as much as possible. Unlike plenty of bees, yellow jackets have a stinger without a barb. It's no fun being around them or running into their nests, which provides home to thousands of jackets or up to 50,000 in just one summer. They don't produce the buzzing sound like bees either. That happens because of differences in their behavior. Bumblebees and honeybees fly from one flower to another and gather pollen and nectar, which is also food for the colonies. 
If you see them flying around at grass level, they're probably collecting food they'll later take to their nest. Yellow jackets aren't that much into flowers, so they don't need to shake their wings as intensively as bees. They don't transfer or collect pollen. These wasps are predators that prefer spiders, insects, and decaying fruit. If you're having a picnic with a basket full of tasty food, get ready for an unwanted visit. Cover the food to keep them away. Their most active time is late summer and early fall. Jackets start their colony in the spring. The lone queen does it by herself. She needs to survive the harsh winter conditions first, after which she lays eggs. The colony then grows through spring and summer. When the winter comes, the old queen is done with her work, so she can now pass the crown to the new queen that will start the next cycle. None of the other wasps survive either. Both yellow jackets and bees have black and yellow bodies and are almost the same size. Bees are more hairy and chunky, while yellow jackets are not that furry or fat. They're more smooth and slender. Wasps also have a waist. It attaches their abdomen to the thorax, the body part between the midsection and the head. Honeybees live in tree holes in nests beekeepers provide them with. Jackets prefer to make their nests in exposed pipes, holes, in walls, old furniture, or even below the ground. They find some old rodent burrows and often make their nests in lawns on spots with no grass, so it's easier to accidentally step on them or disturb them with a lawnmower. Yellow jackets are way more aggressive and fierce than bees since they're predators and have a really strong instinct to protect their nests. They tend to go after people for violating their peace and will follow you over a long distance if necessary. They'll pass all obstacles and wait for their moment. If you're running away from them, don't go into the water and dive in because they'll be patiently waiting for you to run out of breath to take their revenge. Don't run in panic waving your arms around because they'll probably be faster and way more frustrated as they see you as a threat. Just raise your hands and protect the eyes first, then slowly start moving away. Honeybees sting when they really don't have another choice. They're not mean by their nature. Neither they nor wasps are hostile if they don't feel threatened. Yellow jackets are way easier to provoke than bees. When they see something they find dangerous coming towards, they release certain chemicals that alert the family, so they'll chase you. Wasps can make a nest from paper. First, they chew up pieces of bark and then spit it out, which is how they make a paper rougher. They all look the same to us, but wasps can recognize each other by identifying unique facial patterns they all have. They come in crazy colors including green, blue, red, and orange. The smallest insect in the world is a parasite wasp, often called a fairy fly. Male wasps are blind, don't have wings, and they're only 0.005 inches long. There are over 30,000 species of wasps, but two groups in general. Social wasps live in colonies, and solitary wasps prefer to have their nests on their own and live alone with their young. Social wasps use the stingers as a way to defend themselves. Solitary wasps use them for hunting, together with the venom they have inside. Solitary wasps aren't into stinging people and won't go after us. They help humans by taking care of insect populations on their plates. Mud dauber wasps are close relatives to ants. The ants started out as some sort of predatory wasp themselves. But ants are even more related to bees than to social wasps, and they all have the same family tree. They have spread all over the Earth's dry land, populating virtually every imaginable ecosystem. There are more than 10,000 trillion ants on our planet at any moment. One study of a Brazilian rainforest says the overall mass of the ants that lived in that area was around four times bigger than the mass of all reptiles, mammals, and amphibians together. Here's a fun fact. It's only female bees that can sting. Larger male drone bees don't even have stingers. This is because the stinger is basically a modified egg-laying device. Queen bees also have stingers. These bees are bigger than the average worker. The queen has an average size of just under one inch. It's about twice the size of your regular worker bee. Because of its large size, many people think that the queen bee's sting hurts the most. So let's dive into it. First of all, queen bees rarely sting because of their job in the hive. The queen is the most important bee in the colony as it's the only female that can reproduce. The queen has two main jobs in the hive. Number one, she produces chemical scents that help unify the rest of the bees so they can work together. 
Number two, she lays a lot of eggs, up to 2,000 a day. The queen is surrounded by worker bees who meet her every need at all times. They give her food. The attendant workers also collect and then distribute the queen's pheromones, which stops the workers from finding a new queen. But despite being the head of the hive and being much bigger than other bees, the queen's sting is actually the least painful. This is because regular bees have barbed stingers. This means that when they attack, the stinger gets stuck in your skin, making it really difficult to remove. The stinger also contains nasty venom that's packed with proteins. That's what causes the pain and affects your immune system and skin cells. The stinger continues to pump venom into your body for more than 10 minutes or until it gets removed. But unlike workers, queen bees leave the hive very rarely. Their main job is to lay eggs, and it's down to the rest of the colony to protect the hive and the queen. That's why worker bees are the ones with the most powerful sting. This is how they can ward off potential dangers. The only reason the queen would really need to defend herself is against rival queens. Because of this, the queen has no need to develop a nasty stinger. Hers is instead a lot smoother. This means that the barbs don't get stuck in your skin, which can be mega uncomfortable. While this might sound good, it does come with a bit of bad news. Because of the smoothness of its stinger, the queen can jab you multiple times. The stinger is attached to the bee's digestive tract, nerves, and muscles, all of which are essential for the bee to function normally. When workers sting, they're unable to pull their stinger out because of the barbs. And when they try to get free, it doesn't end well for them. But the queen stinger doesn't get stuck. That's why the bee doesn't feel any negative consequences. And still, she'll basically only sting you if she doesn't have one of her bodyguards nearby, which is highly unlikely. So what's the worst place to be stung by a bee? A man called Michael Smith decided to find out. He got stung on 25 different body parts and rated each prick on a pain scale between 1 and 10. He found out that the most tender area was the nostrils, scoring a 9 out of 10, followed by the upper lip, which he estimated as an 8.7. The three least painful locations were the skull, middle toe tip, and upper arm. All of these scored a 2.3. But moving back to the queen, how does a regular bee gain this title? The queen bee rarely needs replacing, as she can live for a whopping five years. At the same time, a worker bee born in the summer usually only survives for about six weeks. But if the queen passes away or moves to another hive, the colony needs to replace her. Doing this requires something called royal jelly, which nurse bees produce in their heads. They feed it to newly hatched honeybee larvae. It's basically a superfood that contains loads of useful stuff, including vitamin B, proteins, hormones, and sugars. After feeding baby bees for three days, workers select just a few larvae and continue giving them the royal jelly. The others will have a less nutritional diet. The royal jelly triggers new phases of development for these growing bees. And one of the most important is growing special organs they need to lay eggs. But people still don't fully understand how this process works. Some scientists say that it's not the royal jelly itself that causes a bee to turn into a queen. They think it's the exclusion of other natural plant-based chemicals from the queen's diet. But even though we aren't 100% sure how these special bees appear, we do know why there's just one queen in the end. When the first queen emerges, she searches for the other bees who've been fed the same royal jelly. And then she wipes out the competition. If several queens emerge at the same time, it's time to grab your popcorn. They'll hunger games it out in a dramatic fight until only one remains. And that's how bees get their queen. Other bees in the hive also have important jobs. These include foraging for food, tending to young larvae, and building a honeycomb. Drones, or male bees, have one singular job. They mate with the queen. And when they're not trying to mate, they eat from honey reserves and do pretty much nothing. Female bees, or worker bees, do everything else. They keep the hive clean, take care of larvae, tend to the queen, store honey, build cells, forage, guard the nest, pollinate, and even feed male bees. Each bee knows exactly what job to do. 
That's because their specific hormones activate parts of their genetic makeup that tell them what needs to be done and when it needs to be done. Bees have four job phases in their lifetime. Phase one starts about three weeks after they get born. That's when they get to work cleaning the cells from which they've emerged. Three days later, they enter phase two. In this phase, they're in charge of feeding other bees. This lasts for about a week. Then they enter phase three. They move further away from the hive center and become handy helpers. They build the honeycomb and guard the hive's entrance. This period also lasts for around a week. After that, they enter the fourth and final phase, the foraging stage. It's definitely the most dangerous part of our stripy friends' lives. This is where they leave the nest, look for pollen, bring it home, and feed the colony. They also leave a stinky footprint on the flowers they touch when collecting pollen. This way, they can figure out if their bee relatives have been here or if it's been a stranger. Sometimes they discover their own footprints. <laughs> Unbelievable! Bees first appeared on Earth 130 million years ago, and they outlived dinos. What helped them survive for so long is an incredibly complex structure of their society and teamwork. Each bee has its own role and responsibility. Some of them build and repair their home, some bees protect it, others clean the hive and get food. But what if you could sneak into a hive and figure out how this whole system works? What would you see inside? For some mysterious reason, it's easy for you to get past the guards. But if you were a bee from another colony, they wouldn't let you in without a fight. The guard bees look rather intimidating. They stand on their back four legs at the hive's entrance, their front legs raised in the air. These bees inspect every insect entering the hive with their antennae and front legs. Each hive has its own odor. And the guards can understand if a bee belongs to their colony by smelling it. Only the bees that live in the hive can get inside. Suddenly, you see something strange. One of the guard bees has detected an intruder. An alien bee must have mistakenly tried to enter the wrong hive. But it's carrying a load of nectar. And the guard lets it in. Apparently, they don't mind accepting free gifts of food, even from strangers. You feel too curious to linger there any longer. The hive has only one entrance. You notice that the walls around it look strange. You take a closer look and understand that it's coated with a thin layer of some substance. It's propolis, hardened plant resin produced by bees. It helps fight infections and cures different health problems. A bit further, you can see countless honeycombs. They're densely packed hexagonal cells made of beeswax. Bees use them to store food, pollen, and honey. That's where they keep eggs, larvae, and pupae. Honeycombs are fixed to the walls of the hive. They stretch from top to bottom and are even attached to the sides. But you spot narrow passageways along the comb edges. Bees use them to move around the hive. You might also be able to squeeze through one of these tunnels. After exploring the place, you figure out that bees store honey in the upper part of the comb. Beneath, there are cells that contain pollen. Then, there are cells used for keeping eggs with future worker bees. And at the very bottom, there are drone eggs. Of course, your ultimate goal is to see the queen bee, but it's not that easy to find her. First, you come across lots of other bees. Most of them are workers. They make up the largest part of the hive's population, and they're all ladies. Each of them has its own task. The most common of them is foraging. You spot a bee leaving a hive and decide to follow it. The queen can wait a bit. You want to see how bees provide food for the hive. The bee is buzzing ahead of you. After visiting a couple of flowers, it suddenly starts wiggling while hovering in one place. Ah, that's the famous bee dance. That's how bees communicate. Once a forager finds a perfect supply of nectar, it starts to perform a very precise dance. It consists of a series of straight lines and figure eights. Throughout the dance, the bee is also shaking its wings. How long the dance lasts means how far away from the hive the nectar is. Every 75 milliseconds is another 330 feet to the distance. And how intense the dance is depends on the richness of the source of the nectar. The stronger the waggle is, the more nectar the bee has found. And there's also the angle of the dance. It shows the direction of the nectar in relation to the sun. Your bee must have found tons of nectar. It's practically vibrating. Suddenly, it starts flying back to the high. You follow it. There, the bee does a shake dance in front of the other worker bees. This is how it tells other bees they need to go foraging right away. You decide to stay behind and just watch what will happen. 
Soon, the bees return. They've brought back a lot of nectar that needs to be ripened in the honey. Your bee does a tremble dance this time. It's shaking its legs in a way that makes its body tremble all over. This little dance makes other workers get down to process the nectar. It's time for you to resume your search. You dive back into the hive and begin to squeeze through small passageways. You come across the cells where worker bees begin their lives as eggs. It takes a bee 21 days to develop from an egg into a full-grown worker. The first task of this new worker is to clean the cell where it grew. The cell then becomes a nursery for a new egg, and the bee looks after this egg. Later, it feeds the larva and keeps it warm. During the next stage of its life, when it's 12 to 20 days old, the bee starts doing chores around the hive. It produces wax, stores pollen and nectar, builds the comb, guards the entrance, and so on. When the bee turns 20 days old, it becomes a forager. It looks for and delivers pollen, nectar, and tree resin to make propolis. The bee also brings water. Bees need it for drinking and cooling the hive. At one point, you see something that looks like a hospital room? There, worker bees look after those that feel unwell. The doctors bring them different types of honey, depending on their infection. If there's no other way, they remove a sick bee from the hive. It helps to prevent the entire colony from getting ill. And then, there are also temperature control bees. The temperature in the hive is usually around 95 degrees Fahrenheit. It's crucial to keep it this way, not hotter, not colder. Otherwise, the eggs won't hatch. You see a group of bees and instantly understand they're temperature bees. Apparently, the temperature in the hive has dropped, and now the bees are trying to warm it up. They're vibrating in a special way, which raises their body temperature. And you can feel the air around you become a bit warmer. And if they needed to cool the hive, they would go and gather some water droplets. Then they would bring this water on their backs. Once in the hive, the temperature bees would buzz their wings very fast, making the water evaporate and lower the temperature. 